on camera. Today's January 29th, 2018. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the History Center, and with me today is Tony Hilliard, who's also a volunteer, and Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy. Uh, we're here in connection with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, and we're honored to have today with us Mr. John Miller. Uh, Mr. Miller has agreed to come in and share his experiences both in the military and life in general uh, for the Veterans History Project, and his story is being recorded and will be put on file at the History Center and the Library of Congress. Mr. Miller, we really appreciate you coming in here today. Uh, would you give us your full name in the city and state where you currently live? John Howell Miller II, Decatur, Georgia. Okay. Uh, where and when were you born? Tallahassee, Florida, January 20, 1953. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, I spent a lot of time in the woods and um, I was not a good student and I wasn't even a good son. Um, I tended to find ways to get into trouble and I never got into anything really bad. I was fascinated by automobiles and um, I skipped a grade in school and that stunned a lot of people because they just could not imagine me scoring well on something because otherwise there was no indication of anything other than a flat line inside of my head. And um, got into high school, uh, did not excel, and so one day we took the SAT and the scores came back and I did pretty well and more stunned people. Um, so started talking about college. I was in a college prep program at my high school but not doing very well. And um, so I started looking at universities. I wanted to be an engineer and didn't know what that meant. But my dad had been in a construction battalion in World War II. And whenever I talked about the menial task that I saw before me, he said, no, engineering would be a good thing for you to do. So I started looking at Auburn. Uh, looked at Georgia Tech, had an uncle that lived in Smyrna at the time. I was in Tallahassee. You could not go to University of Florida if you grew up in Tallahassee. It was a bitter, bitter rivalry, even much worse than the UGA Tech thing. It's just hostile. And so um, I somehow I got accepted at Tech and uh, concurrent with that, uh, I found some work at the Florida Department of Transportation in the Estimates Division, and uh, I, I worked there the summer before I came up to Atlanta. And um, I got into the co-op program at Georgia Tech, so every other quarter I went back to Tallahassee, and I worked, and so I, I was paying out-of-state tuition, but I was able to make it work. Um, uh, I will tell you that my greatest chore in life was getting a date. I don't know if you know anything about Georgia Tech, but it's <laughs> it was pretty dry. And I found a girl down there, and we got married at the start of my sophomore year. And if not for that, I would not have completed my matriculation. And uh, it was an alignment that uh, was life-changing. And I say this, uh, she's older than I am, about five years older, and she had graduated from Florida State and she was in the Students for a Democratic Society. And if you remember all of that, if you're Vietnam era, you understand that her anti-war hostilities are very strong and that leads into the rest of my career because after I, gra I graduated from Tech in 75 with a bachelor's in civil engineering and the job market was in the toilet at the time. So um, I had worked in the asphalt lab at Georgia Tech 
and the professor there liked me, so he offered me an assistantship to stay on for a master's. And so I got a master's degree. Um, but when I got my bachelor's, I tried to get into the Navy, into the Civil Engineer Corps at that time. And in 75, the job market was dry. We were coming out of Vietnam, so the Navy was, uh, they had a reduction in force underway. So that didn't work. I uh, stayed around tech for another year, got a master's, and went to work in Orlando in 76, and was down there a couple of years, and came back up here in 78 to work for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And I uh, was inspecting the construction and operation of hydroelectric projects. So uh, by 1980, I had my engineer's license, and I still wanted to be in the Navy construction because my dad was in a battalion in World War II and on Bougainville and the Admiralty Islands and Okinawa. And my uncle was also in a construction battalion. He was on Tarawa and um, Okinawa and some of their stories were pretty intriguing for so me. So they did talk about it? They did talk about it, they did. And, um, you know, stories about being bombed and um, uh, the horror of being, my uncle was on an LST at Tarawa that um, uh, was full of aviation fuel and they got strafed by a Japanese fighter. And uh, so he was able to explain real fear to me. And uh, all of this, all it did was whet my appetite to get into a construction battalion. So by 80, I applied for a direct commission. I had an engineer's license and I was fairly healthy. So I was issued a uniform and sent to charm school. And um, after that, I was assigned to a reserve construction battalion as the personnel officer and the headquarters company commander. And you might want to explain what charm school is for the people that see this that don't know. I think we know. But to well, charm school is an abbreviated version of boot camp, significantly abbreviated. If after a couple of weeks you have learned how to march in a straight line and salute, and uh, you know better than to cuss out your commanding officer, I'd say that you've probably excelled. So um, that wasn't the only, uh, I, I tried to get as much active duty time, active duty for training as I could. I took uh, military training at, out at uh, Port Wanami, California, up in the hills. They sent us up, uh, I, I was, with active duty uh, CB officer candidates at that time and uh, uh, spent a lot of time on the rifle and pistol range and uh, learning military skills. Also learned a lot of personnel administration, military law. And so a lot of the same things that the uh, officer, the active duty candidates were getting, I got too. I just happened to be a reserve officer that was coming through in smaller segments of time. And uh, I, for some reason, I found my niche. And um, after uh, two years, I was made company commander over the reserve CBs uh, throughout Georgia. And uh, we had a detachment in Columbus at Fort Benning. And uh, there was another up at Chattanooga and uh, one here in Atlanta at the Naval Air Station. And uh, most of what I got out of that was learning to pay attention to my chief petty officers because they really raised me. And uh, they taught me everything I needed to know. Uh, the classwork was good, but really in the military, it's all about people. And so learning people skills in the military was really what took me the rest of my military career. Um, 
after, and, and all during this time, I was also an employee of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which was uh, a special gift because I got military leave each year and I would combine my military leave with a bunch of annual leave. And um, unfortunately, I think my family suffered because I was wor really working about two jobs. It was, it was way more than full time. And um, I was made company commander for Georgia, and then I was made the operations officer for the construction battalion, a reserve construction battalion headquartered in Huntsville, Alabama, on the corner of Redstone Arsenal. And we had detachments all over the southeastern United States, from Kentucky uh, down uh, into South Carolina and North Carolina and all over Tennessee and Alabama. So uh, there were about 700 of, of our reserve CBs scattered around, most of whom were Vietnam uh, veterans and had seen uh, active duty time in combat. So again, it was a, a, a wonderful experience to learn. Uh, I had people assigned to me that had um, well, one of them had a, a necklace made out of Viet Cong ears. I mean, that's the kind of people I was trained by. And um, so operations officer, uh, became executive officer. I did some other uh, unit rotations in that period. I went into an officer in charge of construction unit, which is a contracting arm of the Navy learned a lot about contracting, and I did a tour on an admiral's staff during that period, and I was the reserve lieutenant responsible for all of the facilities for Navy fleet hospitals. So I was uh, doing logistics and, uh, and training for the CBs for um, fleet hospitals all over the, the nation, and mostly reserve, but because the fleet hospitals at that time were reserve units. The, they had uh, reserve doctors, nurses, corpsmen, everything, you know. These were full up surgical hospitals, 250 bed, 500 bed, 1,000 bed. And so I was helping get the, the facilities people for them because they had to have a CB contingent. That you don't just uh, operate a, a fleet hospital with, back then you didn't even think about using contractors. You used uh, active duty personnel that had been mobilized. They were reservists that were called up. And were you building the hospitals? We were, they were tents. And uh, the surgical units were containers like you see on the back of trucks. And you pop the sides down and you plug them into the generators that come with it. And you plug them into the, uh, the water purification units that come with it. And you, you, there you go, you got a full up hospital. Mm -hmm. And you can set one of those up in very short order. Mostly you just need a flat place to put it. And so that was the fleet hospital stuff. Um, I spent time with the Navy Construction Regiment during that period, which is a headquarters unit for multiple construction battalions. And that really was all over the Southeast from, uh, from the Mississippi River up past the Potomac and all of Florida. So I was uh, I, th I, was, I think I was in the training department of the regiment, and um, then I came back to the battalion as the executive officer, and that was where I honed some of my personnel skills in administering people who s seemed to need a little more guidance than others. and. Um, can't remember if I fleeted right up into um, the commanding officer or not. I, it seemed like I did something else in there somewhere. And, uh, but I did, uh, I was selected to become commanding officer of the battalion and 
oh my gosh, I'm trying to remember when that was. It must have been about 90 or so, maybe 93, somewhere, somewhere along that. Okay. And um, uh, before I was, yeah, okay, so I was commanding officer. You talked about that best of type. Yeah. Uh, as I said, the people who were in the reserve CBs were mostly Vietnam veterans who had uh, come home and become very successful but still wanted to make sure that they helped uh, with the nation's readiness for whatever next conflict we, we got into. And um, these, um, these really talented people, all, of, all the way from the uh, bosun's mate second class uh, up through the, the commanding officer, the people I learned from were, uh, had their own businesses or they had, uh, they were very high in corporations and uh, uh, the, the people all in between. Most of our enlisted personnel had their own construction companies and they knew more about construction than anybody you would ever come across outside. Um, and they, they just spent a lot of time teaching their young officers what it meant to build something and, and then the Navy did its best to teach us what, how to do that when it was a hostile environment. We sent uh, water well drilling crews all over Central America. We sent crews to Naples a lot. We did a lot of work in, in Italy, sent some to Africa. Um, uh, a lot in the UK because at that time we still had um, the Soviet threat and um, so there was a lot of uh, anti-submarine stuff going on in the UK. So we did a lot of support for that. Uh, a lot of stuff in Korea, um, Japan, and I, I've, I've done active duty tours in most of these places for about a month at a time. Talk about that a little bit, the places you've been and your experiences there, both in, with your responsibilities or just any interaction with the civilians in those places? Sure, civilians, ah, that would be Pohang, Korea. Uh, and not as much with the civilians, but Pohang is where the Korean Marines train. And they are the toughest, meanest people I have ever seen in my life. Uh, the Korean Marines, if you get into an armed conflict, you want to make sure you've got one on either side of you because you won't have any problems with something like that. The Korean Marines, uh, uh, I understand uh, now you were in Vietnam. I don't know if you were ever around any Korean Marines, but the, you would have remembered it. And um, other places, um, Japan, uh, I've participated in some pretty big global exercises from Yokosuka. Uh, that was an old Japanese base that the Navy took over and made a, a major fleet headquarters out of. It's a little bit south of Tokyo. And uh, these were, um, readiness exercises to prepare for the North Koreans doing something bad and evacuation of the South Korean Peninsula and how do you deal with all those people. Um, I took a construction crew to Estonia, spent about a month there. We were part of a larger group uh, that was training Estonian Defense Force personnel while we were also doing a lot of construction. There was a a homeless shelter in downtown Tallinn that we rebuilt. There was um, uh, some uh, military base work that we did uh, in a little ta town called Tartu, which was the um, an advanced base for the Soviet uh, anti-air missile defense for Mother Russia. And we soon learned that um, the way Russia intended to defend itself was to sacrifice uh, those uh, states, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, just sacrifice them. And um, 
they were going to protect Mother Russia. Oh. And it wasn't the first time something like that had happened. Um, uh, we talked about, um, you know, you said interfacing with the locals. Well, in Estonia, um, they fought for the Nazis when the Russians came in from the east because they they detested the Nazis, but they so hated the Russians because the Russians had always treated them so badly. And uh, Chernobyl, when Chernobyl went bad and cooked off all, all of its nuclear stuff, they took the males from Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania and used them for the cleanup. So by the time I got to Estonia, there was a, an age gap from about 30 to 40 of the male population that was not there. Oh. To give you an idea how the Estonians felt about the Russians. Yeah. And that's very interesting. I, I'd never heard that about the cleanup yeah. of Chernobyl. And they, yeah, that's drafting what, those people to do it. Whereas, yeah, and you know, they just loaded them in a truck and that was Gosh. what happened. Uh, what else? Because most of my military time was reserve, and most of my military reserve time was in the construction forces. And there was a lot of that uh, that was, um, well, it, it, it was training for, the, for mobilization, mm -hmm. but it was, um, it was a very full time. Uh, we, we were very busy. I, I probably did 40 days of active duty every year. So um, I, I used up all my military leave, used up all my annual leave, used up uh, leave without pay, whatever it was. But I, I got two full careers out of it. So um, it, it made for a good life, but I loved my time with the construction people. And um, all during this period, I was, a, I was rising in my career with uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and then after eight years with them, I, I transferred over to the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and I became their regional civil engineer. And uh, I'd, I developed a bunch of multifamily housing, um, in 98, uh, they offered me a, an opportunity to go to D.C. And so we moved from Decatur up to D.C. in 98. And that was one of the best things that ever happened to my military career because I was working uh, my day job at LaFont Plaza and my military job was at the Washington Navy Yard. And that place is spectacular. Uh, when I first started going there, you almost needed to have an armed escort to get from the Eastern Market Metro Station down to the Navy Yard because the neighborhood was so bad. And by the time we left out of there in 2008 or so, um, it, it, it was just like Buckhead. Uh, all, of, uh, all of the public housing that was in that area was raised and made mixed income, kind of like the Techwood housing development here. And the, um, the Marines built, uh, that's where 8th and I is, and I don't know if that term means anything to you. That's where the Commandant of the Marine Corps lives, and uh, it's right at the Eastern Market metro station. It's between there and the Washington Navy Yard. And um, there's a parade field there. And during the summer, every Thursday night, um, the Marine Corps Band, the, the Marine Corps Band, not the one that you see, because every, every Marine base has got a band. This is the Marine Corps Band and the Marine Corps Drum and Bugle Corps. And uh, the, the Marine Corps Rifle Guard uh, parade out there, and it's a big fundraiser for the Marine Corps because they uh, they honor various members of Congress, and so the Congress guys, 
to drive a couple of blocks to the Navy Yard and they're, they're putting the seat of honor and they've got, uh, you know, 600 Marines out there doing what Marines do best. And when they leave, they vote to fund more stuff for the Marine Corps. The Marines are pretty smart. <laughs> they are extremely <laughs> bright. <laughs> uh, they're, I, I love my Marines. We spent a lot of times, that's, that's really what the, the CBs were supposed to do is to support the Marines um, with whatever facilities they required, be it the piers to get their stuff in or um, uh, camps or whatever, that's, that's what we did. By the time I retired, we'd gotten away from that. Um, uh, by about 2010, uh, Kellogg Brown and Root and their tentacles, their financial tentacles had found ways to suck all the dollars out of the Department of Defense so that their contract personnel could do all of the wow. stuff that the military used to do. Uh, and, um, How and did I'm the quality of work change, if you feel comfortable talking about that? Yeah, I, I could. You know, I'm a strong believer in contracting things. Um, it, it can work very well if you've got good contracting people. Um, but I got, you know, there was like this Senator Vitter from Louisiana. Um, when I was in Baghdad, I was the realist, uh, part of what I did was manage real estate for the international zone. So that, um, uh, oh, let's say there were 30,000 people in the international zone. It was six square miles. And we had a lot of military personnel, but there were a lot of contractors in there too. And, uh, and and it was kind of the Wild West. Um, uh, there was a, a contractor from Louisiana who had um, responsibility for moving stuff around, and we caught them operating um, uh, uh, whorehouses. And, uh, you know, it was a big money operation, and they, you know, the, it was so obvious that they were running slaves. They would bring in people from Pakistan, and um, and these were people that uh, couldn't move anywhere except where this one contractor would place them. Uh, I mean, they were in bondage, and they only got the food that the contractor decided to feed them, and the place where they lived was just awful, and that was inside the international zone. And, um, and they were running guns. And I don't know who they were selling the weapons to, but we caught them with containers full of automatic weapons. And so I threw them out of the international zone. And I said, you can't have a footprint here. And that's when my office got bombarded by, from Vitter's office <coughs> about what good, decent Americans these were and, um, uh, and how we should uh, do everything we we could to uh, improve their lot, and uh, I never saw any activities like that with uh, KBNR. But um, it it was the Wild West, like it. and so we we had to do what we thought was right. Um, well, that's good that you did that. You made the effort. <laughs> Very interesting over there. Very well, that, interesting. That sort of, sort of transition to the next thing I wanted to ask you about. I, we'd like to hear your experiences in Baghdad and where else, wherever else you were in the Middle East. Just yeah, just I had I had done it. a couple of trips to Bahrain when I was with uh, one of the reserve units. I was with was a, a contingent for the commander in chief of that fleet. And the fleet's headquartered at Manama. So I'd done a couple of active duty tours there. So I was familiar with at least the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And um, so then when I got orders, I guess it was 2006 when I got the orders to go to Baghdad to spend a year there, uh, I was called the installation director for the international zone. And I was 
uh, with the Joint Area Support Group, which had uh, facilities responsibility for a pretty big area there, uh, and the group that I was with was right in uh, the international zone. That's the area that we administered. And um, so it was uh, the headquarters unit was Pennsylvania National Guard, Army National Guard, and they were strictly logistics people. And uh, we administered all of the security for the international zone and the water and the sewer and the electricity and transportation. Um, and we had, um, I think we had two infantry divisions headquartered there. Now that's not to say that their people were, you know, we didn't have two divisions of people there, but their headquarters uh, was right there in the international zone, and they, you, you could not believe the facilities we were operating out of because these were um, various palaces that Hassan, uh, Saddam Hussein had built when he was in power. And um, so he was living there and we went in with these, these munitions, these uh, guided music, munitions, and if two of those hit a building, everybody in it was dead, but the building hadn't quite toppled. So those were the places where everybody lived in these infantry divisions was in these shattered buildings, these shattered palaces. And you could look down the hallway and the floor kind of went like that. And we had, we had other um, infantry personnel in there. There was a, a large contingent from the uh, country of Georgia and they were well known because they would go into the exchange and fill their pockets with stuff and then they all had to be strip searched on the way out of the exchange for all the stuff they had stolen. And they were probably in the worst one of these palaces that was, it was not safe to be inside of. And then there was another one of these palaces that had not been completed before we launched our attack, and it still had a tower crane going up through the middle of it. Well, when we put the munitions into the building, three of the floors pancaked down on each other, and there was enough space to crawl through in the basement, and that's where a bunch of these people were living. And the, um, the tower crane had been shot through on two of the legs, so it was leaning over, and this was a big tower crane. And uh, during heavy winds, uh, well, the brakes had been shot off of it, so it would just spin wildly in the wind. I got some nice photographs from up there. And uh, there, uh, there was the reviewing stand where Saddam Hussein used to watch his wonderful troops come by with the crossed sabers. And we were there when somebody went in there and tried to cut the cross sabers out with a cutting torch one night, and it just happened. You know, you just don't know what's going on and stuff like that. The, one, of, uh, one of my best friends in our unit was the director of security, and he was a reservist. He, um, he was a police chief in, in his uh, civilian life, and uh, so he and I would hang out together and he'd just read the police blotter to me from the last night's activities uh, there in the international zone. And uh, for some reason, the locals did not understand how heavy our armored equipment was. Uh, I'm talking about the, the Bradley fighting vehicles and the tanks and stuff like that. And they didn't understand that driving 65 miles an hour inside of a six square mile area wasn't a great idea. So every morning we'd, we'd look at the blotter and it would have some new interesting little snip of information about a white bongo truck. And that's, those, they look like Nissan pickup trucks 
white pickup truck with six in it would have come into direct contact at a high rate of speed with a Bradley fighting vehicle and there was a white stripe about a foot long on the Bradley and the white bongo truck was completely destroyed and the six occupants were in various hospitals around the IZ. So uh, you talk about locals. I, I just never did understand that, that analysis. What were they thinking? But, you know, um, and that, it was an interesting time. We had, um, we were there during a period of about six months of significantly escalated rocket fire. So that for about six months, about three times a day, we would get rocketed. And a rocket attack lasts about 20 seconds and you have no idea when will that 20 seconds begin and when will it end. You just don't know. And then sometimes it was mortar fire. The mortars, you know, those guys were a little bit closer. The rockets, they were across the river, across the Tigris River. And that would be somebody with a couple of PVC tubes and some rockets, and that's all they needed. They could drive up somewhere with their little truck and they could uh, triangulate off some known geographic uh, like buildings or whatever, and they throw rockets at us and they didn't care where they landed. I mean, it was just some way to get back at us and or terrorize us or make a statement. I don't know what the deal was, but um, a 122 millimeter rocket can do a lot of damage when it lands. Um, I was, uh, I, one of the things that I enjoy is playing music. I play guitar. And so while I was over there, I connected with a, a guy that was a um, um, hospital administrator and another guy that was a civilian working for, um, uh, for the oil ministry that we had set up there. He was a, a judge from back in um, either Indiana or Illinois, but uh, uh, he was a great musician. So we would get together and play, and we were getting ready to play one night, and I was down in my office. My office was in the basement of Saddam's presidential palace. And <laughs> fascinating place. They, they told me that the rug that was on the floor of my office was worth about $10,000. And didn't mean anything to me. I knew that I had a bidet that was gold. And I had um, a bathtub that was the darndest thing I'd ever seen because Apparently the Iraqis are narrower than I am because I couldn't get in and out of the daggum thing. It was so narrow. Um, the Saddam's vault was just down the hall and there were millions of dollars in gold in there and all kind of uh, special alcohol and whatever else. Um, I. But I was sitting in my office before we were gonna play one day and another rocket detonated right outside my office. It almost blew the windows out of my office. And um, about 20 minutes later, I learned that one of our Pennsylvania National Guard guys that was a pretty good friend of mine had been killed and a, um, a, a civilian contractor was, he was standing and talking to her right outside the little laundry facility that we had and it, it killed both of them and it wounded a bunch of other people that were around there. That's just the way the day went. Um, I was in my, uh, I was going back to my little hooch. We had, um, our living quarters were metal house trailers, real small ones. And I had my own cause I was a, an, an 06. And uh, most of the time it was two people to one of these hooches. But I went back one day and I, I looked on a chair and I didn't 
quite understand what I saw. But I looked down at it. I mean, dadgum, that's a bullet. And um, so I picked it up and I looked and I looked over and there was a hole that matched it in the top of my hooch. Well, over there, uh, celebratory gunfire is just one way of passing the time of day for some of the locals. Uh, they get an AK and cook off a magazine full of rounds and if they landed somewhere, as long as it didn't land on top of them, they didn't care. And uh, so I, uh, I don't think I wore my soft cover after that. I think I, I wore my, my helmet whenever I was outside. Uh, and, and it's not that it would have mattered, but... Um, Makes you feel a little more secure. Yeah, you know, and it, and it was... F there, we had a saying over there, and it... Uh, you know, it's all fun and games, but then after a certain amount of time, it just wasn't fun anymore. It, it was... About how long were you there? A full year. Full year. Uh-huh. Yeah, used to take helo rides. Um, we would uh, have meetings with, because I was on, you know, I wasn't in direct contract with General Petraeus, but he was my boss. He's the guy that signed my medal. And um, so we had staff meetings out at the Baghdad International Airport where his headquarters was. And he would, he would come into the international zone. It was about five miles out there. And it was, it was pretty hostile territory between where we were and where he was. But you get on the helo at the, it was LZ Washington, right in the downtown international zone. And you get on the helo there. And if you made a left turn coming up, you said, this is pretty good because you knew in five minutes you were going to be out at the airport and you could get off the daggum thing. Um, if you turned right, it might be, you never knew what the operation of those helos was going to be. You might go to 15 cities before you were going to your destination. You just, you just didn't know. But if you went over Sodder City, that's where you really got right with the Lord. Uh, it, there's nothing that will teach you how to pray like uh, riding in a helo over some very hostile area. Because we, while I was there, we had a helo go down uh, in mechanical difficulties, and they got in a, a, a tussle with, with some locals. And it wasn't that the locals were hostile, but there were groups of insurgents everywhere. You, you didn't know when uh, you were going to get accosted, and, and they meant business, you know, the, the automatic weapons, they'd open up on you. Um, and uh, between that and the rocket fire, um, and it was never, uh, you, you know, that, that was a year I was never comfortable the whole daggum year. Uh, inside of the international zone, there was a little place called Little Venice, and it was a uh, an area up against the bank of the Tigris that had a lot of uh, small palaces for Saddam's high-ranking officials to live. And um, the Kurds lived there. They had a contingent in Little Venice. Well, the Kurds didn't get along with the Sunnis, and the Sunnis didn't get along with the rest of them. And nobody liked it. You know, there were, there were religious groups or uh, custom groups or whatever, you know, uh, whatever their heritage was that going back thousands of years, they just didn't like each other. And uh, I was responsible for taking the, uh, the head of the Iraqi House of Representatives around to look at some of these properties because they wanted them back. We owned them. We'd taken them fair and square, and now the new government of Iraq wanted them back because they wanted to do stuff with them. And so I was, like I said, the real estate guy. So I took, I was taking him around. We had a bus, had a couple of our guys on it. I, I had a sergeant major uh, assigned to me. He was like my life. Uh, 
he knew what to do. He always knew what to do. Also had a um, an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, an active duty Air Force Lieutenant Colonel assigned to me, uh, a couple other uh, officers and a whole bunch of enlisted. And um, so the Air Force Lieutenant Colonel and the Sergeant Major and I were ferrying these guys around. We had an interpreter and um, we got into Little Venice and the Kurds found out that there was a Sunni on the, the bus and then found out he was the head of the House of Representatives. And so they all drew their weapons on us and they were pretty intent on uh, just doing us away. And um, the interpreter, it was about 30, 45 minutes before uh, we got released only because the interpreter talked us through the whole thing. And uh, it's not that we understood the language that was being used, but you can, when somebody's got an automatic weapon ready to roll, yeah. you know what's going on. Yeah. Um, my Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, he was a contract administrator. He, he knew more about contracts than any other 50 people I'd ever been around. But he, they had never trained him on military stuff. And so, it's like my lieutenant colonel popping his head up, wanting to know what's going on. And the sergeant major, sir, you need to keep your head down. <laughs> and it just, it, this was not a joking matter. And it's, he didn't have a need to be looking around. Um, we, like I said, we took a lot of rocket fire. There was a, a shower trailer right near my office that a young lady was um, taking a shower in. This was one of the stories that people love to tell because, you know, the, the thought of a female without her clothes on running around a base, but she, she wasn't hurt. But the rocket landed right next to that shower trailer and it blew up another trailer right there and she was taking a shower and she, and it, I mean, some of the shrapnel went through the, the trailer where she was and she came out of there at a very high rate of speed. Um, my own little hooch, uh, I, I got the, uh, a bad, bad feeling about it one day because uh, it was almost like they were zeroing in on my hooch to blow up um, because if you took a, a equilateral triangle and, and put a dot in the center of it, that's where my hooch was and these other three rockets had detonated and blown stuff all to smithereens, blew up a laundry trailer. Um, now the good news was that we owned the night. If something got launched from somewhere, it had a signature on it at night and our guys would obliterate whatever caused that signature. So they stopped shooting at us at night, but between about daylight and dark, um, you just never knew what was going to happen. And, uh, you know, you would be worried if you were up against any of the boundaries of the international zone, you'd be worried about snipers. It was all the time something wonderful happening right up against us. And we had a septic uh, lift station, a sewer lift station, just outside the international zone. So we had to deal with that from time to time. And you always had a big armed guard with you and you had your best, most knowledgeable people dealing with stuff like that. Um, and that, that lift station uh, about three blocks of that one day, we heard all hell break loose. And there was a run and gun battle. It lasted about, uh, I'm gonna say about an hour before you, you know, all of a sudden you heard this incredibly loud explosion. And uh, then it was all quiet. And what had happened was they'd gotten all these bad guys and finally got them hemmed into this one building and from about 30 kilometers away, they'd launched something. And it went in one of the windows of this building and it just, it 
flattened the whole thing out and there was nothing left. Um, when you were with uh, this, re this Iraqi representative and some of the other indigenous people, the local people, did they talk at all about their situation, about the war and what was going on? Yeah, we, we especially our, um, our our translators, and because they were local, you know, these were people like they'd been a college professor mm -hmm. up until the invasion, and then they were trying to find ways just to keep their families alive. So they were uh, serving as translators, uh, some of them serving uh, as help in a, in a hotel that was there, uh, doing anything they could uh, to, to make a, something that approached a living. And, um, you know, these were people that, they were good, decent people. I, one of them I especially remember was, um, was a preacher because you think that well everybody over there is a Muslim and that ain't right. There's Christianity all over the place. There's Roman Catholics. There's all kind of stuff going. On. There's even uh, limited. Uh, you know, Saddam Hussein didn't care anything about religion. If there were Jewish people uh, in Iraq, you know, it's probably not the best place for them, but they were there, and so. Um, then the war comes and all of a sudden people are mad at each other again and they're carrying weapons. Um, but this preacher, uh, I can't remember what, maybe he was Episcopal and he was Iraqi and he had been born and raised there and all he wanted to do was to continue to profess the gospel. And so here he is out in an absolute nightmare of a place. and. Um, he was he was doing his work. Um, we had there were a lot of kids in the international zone. There were Boy Scout troops, Girl Scout troops, and one of the things that my people tried to do was to clean the place up because if you had a a, a big pile of garbage, somebody could plant an improvised explosive device in it and you know cause some pretty serious harm. So. Uh, we tried to keep the gar the garbage picked up. Well, this was not um, something that the Iraqi people had been raised with, was garbage collection. They just, you know, if you drank a carton of milk, you threw the carton down. If Whatever it was, you got done with it, you threw it down. It didn't matter. And um, so we were changing the hearts and minds by, we would bribe the children with potato chips. And we would tell them that if we came back in a week, if all of this area was cleaned up, that here's another case of Lay's potato chips for you. And so that worked pretty well. It, it was pretty good. Uh, what year was this? 06, 07. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, David Petraeus was the commander in chief. Um, I'm trying, Ryan, oh, I can't remember the, um, the, um, the ambassador name. I, I spent time in his office. He was a great guy. He looked a little bit like you. He was a runner. And uh, my goodness, we used to see him in the international zone running his 10 miles every day, you know, around in circles and <laughs> with, with uh, Secret Service people all around him <laughs> riding bicycles. And, uh, you know, this, that was just the way it was. Uh, it was one particularly interesting thing. His office was on the second floor of the embassy there. And one day a rocket struck the column that was just between two of his windows. And if it had gone one foot either direction, it would have killed him. So we all felt like that was a pretty good deal. Yeah. Now, the, before we move on, the, the international zone, is that where the people, the non-Iraqi people that were working over there or serving over there lived? No, they were all over the place. They were everywhere. The international zone was really, I think that, that uh, a couple of infantry division headquarters, but mostly the embassy. 
Okay. This was for the State Department people oh. to have some place that was halfway safe. Okay. They called it the green zone because green meant that you didn't have a round in the chamber of your weapon. Yeah. Okay. When you came in the, the green zone, you cleared your weapon and then everywhere you went inside the green zone, if you went in, if like into a, a, a place to eat, uh, a chow hall or whatever, uh, there was a clearing barrel and you cleared your weapon again because okay. uh, they didn't want something uh, bad happening around the State Department people because the State Department people were the absolute opposite of military. They didn't have um, uh, ideas about carrying weapons. They, they specifically didn't want to carry a weapon. They had uh, contractors named Blackwater to do that. And so Blackwater hauled them around, Blackwater shot things that they wanted shot. Um, and you know, one of the really interesting things that we had uh, was uh, a, secret, um, a secret level video of just about anything that went on. So when Blackwater, you know, they would get into uh, gunfights with folks and we'd have the video right there in front of us to see everything about it. Same thing with the, any of the, um, uh, the air activity that we did. Uh, we always could, could look at it. And, okay. You know, those videos of some guy as wandering outside a house and all of a sudden he's killed. Uh, well, that, that's what all that video was about. It's nothing like when you were in Vietnam. Yeah. Wow. You know, everything was somehow under surveillance over there. Now, you were there for a year. Where did you go after you left? Right. Um, you just, I, just continue on with your... your uh, description of what you did. Yeah, well, after I got back, uh, I was getting pretty close to 30 years of civilian service. And while I was gone, and this literally for my family was the year from hell. Okay, I told you, I, I think I told you I got married very young, very young. And we've been married 45 years now. and. Um, uh, the year 2006, right after I left to go, um, my wife's parents were living down in Thomasville, and they were they were pretty aged. So then her mother got really sick, and my wife um, had to go down there to take care of her. And within a month, she was dead. Mm -hmm. So my wife's mother died. My our daughter, our older daughter, had a, had a child, and so she and her husband are hardly the best parents you could ever find. And so my wife was trying to figure out what to do about that. Uh, she was staying down in Thomasville with her daddy, and her dad had dementia, and so she decided to bring him back up here so she could try to take care of him and the granddaughter. So the granddaughter, she was babysitting. The daddy was chasing her around the house at night. And I mean this in the very literal mm -hmm. sense. He was 90 something years old and had totally lost track. So I got to come home mid tour for, I think it was a week or maybe two, I can't remember. And I got home and my wife hadn't slept in a month because she didn't know what was going to happen. So um, first thing I did was I said, well, we're putting him in a nursing home tomorrow morning. She couldn't figure that out. You know, when you get so stressed out, you don't know what's going on. And you really, can't, you're past the point of being able to make any valid decisions. So I came home and we, we took care of that immediately. Well, um, she, she, this was a, a very difficult thing for my wife. And um, <coughs> about that same time, our daughter, our younger daughter, was at Old Dominion University in Norfolk. And she 
was a type one, she's a type one diabetic and her, all of her chemistry had gotten out of whack and so she didn't last at Old Dominion. She came down to be with my wife and so uh, now the child done, never used drugs, didn't drink anything else, but if you're diabetic, you're all messed up. So that's what my wife was dealing with and at least I got her daddy into a nursing home um, over by DeKalb <coughs> General Hospital. Um, and then a month before I came home, he passed away. So she lost both parents while I was gone. And she had, she'd moved, had an incredible burden with an infant, and then had another daughter that was, had all kind of chemical imbalances in her body. So when I got back, both of us were wrecks and we didn't get to live with each other because Jane was down here and I was still up in DC because I still had to finish out my time before I could retire from from HUD and um, another little sidebar about that deployment was uh, George W. Bush had signed uh, an executive order such that any reservist who was called up during that period would have the hospitalization insurance covered, the federal employee hospitalization covered. Well, that means that somebody at the personnel office has to fill out the right form and they didn't do that. And so about three months into my deployment, my wife called me. I had a phone on my desk in Baghdad and she could call me and uh, she said, and she was just destroyed, she said, they've canceled my health insurance. And it was all because this idiot uh, in the personnel office just hadn't done a very simple chore. And, um, I, you know, if you're in a war and somebody mistreats your family back home, it imprints. Well, when I got back, um, I was like, I'm trying to remember, maybe eight, nine months away from having 30 years to retire. And I just, I, I wanted to do harm to some of those people, but I just let it go. Well, I, I and I was, I'm still not right from, from what I went through. Uh, the VA has diagnosed me as 50% disabled from PTSD. Uh, when I'm in a stressful situation, I, I, I'm not a nice person to be around. And uh, uh, I got back and it was everything I could do just to uh, tread water until I could reach my 30 years and five days because in federal service, you, you want to jump over the next little a month beginning so you can get a little bump on your check. I'm not even sure why, why I bothered with that at that point. But uh, I kissed that goodbye. Well, the, and then this goes into my next little thing because at that point, and my wife was starting to stabilize by then, um, so she's still down in, in Atlanta, and I was still living in Vienna, Virginia, and working. Uh, when I left LaFont Plaza, I got an invitation um, to become the facilities officer for the JAG headquarters on active duty with the Navy. So my boss was the three-star JAG, just like you see on the TV show. That was my boss greatest bunch of people there I've ever been around. Uh, the, they're all lawyers and maybe in the upper echelons they weren't the first in their class at Harvard and Yale but all of the junior officers were. These were the smartest young kids I'd ever seen. Well why would they go into the Navy? Well the reason is if you come out of Harvard with your JD, you've got $200,000 in student debt. 
that if you go in the Navy and you do one combat hitch, you can pretty much zero that out. And these kids were lining up to do that. Interesting. Yeah. Now, you know, they were going to Afghanistan, yeah, wow. and they were going to Iraq, and they were going to the Horn of Africa, and they were going to other lovely places. And you do a year like that, and you're debt free, and you still owe the Navy, uh, I think it's like three years or two years or something like that. And so your next tour is in Sigonella, or it's in Rota, Spain, or it's in uh, Bavaria, I mean, or Yokosuka, or uh, Seoul, or somewhere fascinating. And then you, after, after you've done, for these little JAG officers, they finish up their hitch, and then they clerk for some federal judge, and they, they, they streamline their way to the Supreme Court someday. Now that's really smart on the military's part. Well, oh, because gosh. Because they a great staff lawyer. They were awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So I was, I was there for about a year, I, I think. I can't even remember. And after I, maybe over a year. And after I got done with them, uh, I was getting close to 30 years of Navy and 30 years of commission service, they, they volu involuntarily retire you. Okay. And that was fine. And, and I went back to Georgia Tech at that time and um, got a master's in the uh, history and sociology, no, yeah, history and sociology of technology and science is what the degree says. And it's really history of technology. And so, I, and I used the GI Bill for that, and it, it was kind of a good deal. Um, but that was stressful for me. And honest to goodness, I do not handle even the lightest stress well anymore. Um, things just make me a little you know, it makes me pace, it uh, makes me very irritable and fractious. Well, you went through some harrowing times in Iraq. Between... Well, it's, it's worse for an old man. If you send a young kid over there, kid comes back, got a lot of stories to tell. You send an old man over there that's got a bunch of baggage before he goes, and uh, uh, and and sees things in a different light. Uh, somebody gets killed around you when you're an old man. You you think about that person's family. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy that was killed outside my office. His his wife had had a baby. Uh, I don't think he ever saw his child. And um, that that really weigh on you. Um, the contractors that get killed. Uh, I was laying in my bed one evening and I heard a rocket motor burn out right over my hooch and it detonated about 150 meters away and it killed somebody. And this was just, you know, it happened all the time. But the worst part is, you just didn't know when it was gonna be. Yeah. <laughs> After a while, you, you just get a little nervous. We had, Toward the end of my tour, and my tour pretty much coincided with that Pennsylvania Guard unit, and there were some of those guys that did crack up. Well, I, I don't want us to finish without me mentioning it, this. You were, you were awarded the Bronze Star. I was. Uh-huh. That's for staying alive. Uh, anybody over there could have gotten one. You're being modest, I think. Well, I, you know, I did a lot of stuff. We built a lot of stuff, and we moved a lot of stuff around, and we uh, we kept things going that were supposed to be kept going. But it, a lot of other people did too. Well, before we conclude, uh, would you like to say anything about what you're doing now? And so, after I got my MS in history of technology. I was starting to pursue a PhD and I had all the coursework done and uh, took my comprehensive exams and 
I really couldn't even, I couldn't tell you that I even stumbled in my comps. Uh, I didn't do that well. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was very simple questions. I just couldn't process information. And that's my biggest problem right now is processing uh, multiple sets of data. I can't do that anymore. Um, before I went over to Iraq, uh, you know, Excel was my best friend. And so I could, you know, I, I, I could handle all kind of project management stuff. And I'm just not, I can do about one thing at a time anymore. So um, after I realized that uh, I was uh, maybe not going to get a Ph.D. and teach, because I really thought, you know, I'm a young man. I'd like to do something with the rest of my life. But I figured out that I couldn't even grade a paper. I couldn't stand the stress of a kid not making an A. And so uh, these were all things that just told me, well, this ain't going to work. And my wife was saying, well, you know, I could use some help around the house gardening. <laughs> and so we do a lot of gardening. We've got uh, blueberries and fig and pomegranate, all kind of stuff. That we're, and we've got three properties. We've got um, the house that we live in, and we've got a rental property that we bought in 79 over on uh, off North Druid Hills Road. And we, we bought another little rental property out in Tucker. And so administering these is just about as much as I can deal with. Um, I play a lot of music with friends. We do folk music and old time music. And uh, mostly, I'll be very honest with you, most of what I do is trying to figure out what will keep my wife from being angry and pursuing that with vigor. And I'm, <laughs> I'm not often very successful. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you seem to be happy with your life, generally. I am a blessed man. We, um, uh, we've got multiple retirement income streams, and uh, we're not wealthy, but we don't owe anybody any money, and we're doing fine. Um, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that my, my true love of life is a 1979 MG. And um, after that, everything else is way south from there. Um, Never talks back to you, does it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got things that happen in that car. I, I, you know, it's like uh, it's, every now and then it becomes inhabited by a witch. But I know a, a priest named Neil Estes. He owns Neil's Restorations over by the DeKalb Farmer's Market. And he can do a seance with my little car. And about somewhere between $400 and $1,000 later, I get it back and everything's fine. Can't beat that. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Well, Sue, do you or Tony have any questions? I'm curious about the Legion of Merit. Well, I've got two of those. One of them, and let me see if I can remember what I got the first one for. The second one I got at the JAG headquarters. I'm going to tell you what, the JAG loved me, the three star, because I was the first 06 that had ever had that position. It was really an 03 billet, and it was for an active duty 03. But they couldn't find anybody to put in that job because uh, the active duty guys were all going overseas. They were being put in uh, uh, combat roles, and so uh, they needed a reservist to do that job. Well, I was in 06. Okay, the JAGs, they administered the divorces for every aviator and civil engineer corps officer and God knows who else. And so the aviators and the civil engineer corps active duty hate the JAGs because they cost them everything that they owned in their, in their divorce. So when the JAG needed a facilities issue taken care of, he would ask his 03 
to do something about it. And the O3 didn't have any standing at all. You know, an, an O3 in the U.S. Navy has no gravitas. And I would pick up the phone and I'd call the, the facilities officer for whatever base it was and I'd say, get your digital thermometer and come over here and let's sit down and find out what's going on. Um, the, the JAG in July in his office was wearing a heavy coat and gloves because the air conditioning was so jacked up. And he'd never been able to get anything done about this. And I, I said, Admiral, you don't have to live this way. So um, I, I called the facilities guy. I told him to get his contract, come on over. And they found out it was a sensor in one of the, um, uh, the dampers. I mean, it, it was a $100 part. Uh, and that kind of stuff happened all over the place. I was building courthouses for the JAG built one in San Diego, built one at Washington Navy Yard, one in Rota, Spain, and um, there were things that the JAGs wanted that the O3 Civil Engineer Corps officer couldn't get for him. And I didn't have any trouble at all. I could go, you know, if it took an extra $10,000 to get a certain kind of protection for the judge, uh, I could get that. Likewise, the electronics, because all the courthouses nowadays are electronic, and um, uh, they still use turn charts for some stuff, but most of it is on a monitor, and the judge has got the ability to push buttons and make people hush so that uh, he can hear it, nobody else can hear it. They might, uh, for instance, if there's a child that's been endangered, the child is not brought into the courtroom. They, they bring that child in electronically. And so the child's not further traumatized. Uh, and, uh, you know, this stuff costs money. Uh, well, if, if you're building a courthouse, you need to be doing this from the, from the get-go. And uh, the guy that I replaced wasn't able to get it done. And I didn't have any trouble. I got all kind of stuff for all these courthouses. So I got a Legion of Merit for that. And that was my retirement going home gift. Uh, I'm trying to remember when I got the other Legion of Merit. My goodness, you'd think that I would remember something like that. It's probably a staff assignment. I was probably working for a flag officer. I worked for a flag officer a number of times. And that worked out pretty well. Tony, you have any questions? No. Well, is there anything else you would like to say in conclusion, in closing? I'm grateful for you guys doing this. Um, you said you thought that I, stuff I'd done is kind of interesting, but my goodness, I know good and well, because, you know, I had a bunch of these Vietnam veterans that were uh, working with me when I was a junior officer. And I, uh, I likewise, uh, stories are going to be coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan and Somalia and the Horn of Africa and everywhere under the sun. Anytime you get that many people together and, and especially if you add hostile activity into the mix, uh, there's a, or even disaster recovery stuff. And my people have done all kind of disaster recovery stuff for hurricanes and um, you know, these people working together, and the stories are voluminous. Well, your story is unique, and it's not just interesting, but it is unique. And we've done, we've conducted a lot of these interviews, and, and yours is, is unique. And what, what you did, number one, balancing a civilian job and a military job, and then you weren't going in on just weekends, and then you had a year in Iraq, and just your upbringing, I mean, the fact that you describe yourself, not in these words, but sort of a wild child in a way, but you worked hard and you were smart. Got I've been college. very fortunate. I, that, you know, luck does matter. And what you did in the future, I mean, after you got out of college, I mean, you volunteered to serve your country, which is a credit to you right away. You went in harm's way. I mean, you attacked by rockets and 
almost killed by the Kurds. I mean, you, you should have some stress because you were under constant attack in a way when you were over there. And then just a lot of the things you did to help people. I, you passed close to all this a little bit, but you said you uh, dug wells, I believe, and I assume that's to serve mm -hmm. the people that are out there. So you did good well, that by was, helping people. The, the United States government used to call it nation building. We don't do much, you know, we do nation crushing nowadays. We, we did nation building, and I think it was important, and I wish that we did more of that. And you're, you were a big part of that. So we not only want to thank you for coming today, but we want to thank you for your service. And thank you for all you've done for your family, because you obviously went through some bumps in the road like everybody does, but it sounds like you were a good father and good husband and did what you could do to help your family. And so I, we give you credit for that, and thank you for your service. Oh, you're very kind. <laughs> thank you for yours. And thank you all for what you're doing. I, I believe in this program, and if I can help, I'll, I'll be glad to. We will definitely get you involved. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was